everyone. Welcome. And I think we're in for a very interesting program. When the early New England Puritans chose to reject the excessive ritual and structure of the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches, they went back to the Bible for guidance and found a ready-to-hand model for governances in its depiction of the Old Testament Jews. But the colonists' relations with contemporary Jews were more problematic, as was the effort to apply biblical law to their everyday problems and the issues involved in transatlantic trade. These are the issues that our speaker, Michael Hoberman, will explore in today's History Bite, Jews and Puritans in Early America. Michael is a professor of American literature at Fitchburg State University. His areas of expertise include colonial era, the early republic, and antebellum authors, and he has a particular interest in regionalism and the sense of place. He's a graduate of Reed College, received his PhD from UMass Amherst, and has published several books and scholarly articles on New England history and Jewish American culture. His latest book, A Hundred Acres of America, The Geography of Jewish American Literary History, was published by Rutgers University Press <coughs> last year. So please welcome Michael. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to try to take a talk that's usually a 50-minute talk and reduce it down to uh, half an hour. We'll see how that works out. But I always I have the slides here to remind me that I have you know I, there's there's a prop that I can go to to move forward. Um, so I thought I would start by uh, first of all I want to ask who wrote that description. Because that's a fantastic description. I wish. Okay, thank you, George. I, I love that description. That I wish I could have said that on the website about my own book. So thank you. Um, but I, I thought I would say something about how how I got into researching this subject in the first place. Uh, there's a little bit of a story there. Um, when I finished at UMass a thousand years ago. Uh, the PhD that I received at UMass was in American Studies, and my dissertation was on folklore, and I uh, actually did some oral histories, and then I wrote uh, a book about oral traditions among people not far from here in, in Leverett and Shutesbury and, and so on. And so I had gotten in the habit of doing ethno ethnographic research. A few years went by, I started teaching full time, and I needed a new project, and I thought, well, you know, nobody's really done a study of, of Jewish people in small towns in New England. Uh, I knew well enough that uh, I wasn't going to find a, a shelf, let alone a library of books on that subject. <laughs> and so if I wanted to write about Jews in small town New England, the only way to do it would be to do the ethnography. So I set about doing that. This is about uh, 2003, 2004, 2005. I set about um, organizing myself to conduct what ended up being uh, roughly 60 interviews, mostly in places like Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, a little bit in Western Massachusetts. Um, and uh, that's what got me into this project. In particular, there was a story that I heard uh, more than once. I can't remember now if it was twice or three times, but that, you know, th there's always significance to that. If you're a folklorist and you hear the same story in different places, you, 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 you perk up your ears. The story was as follows. So the, the first Jews who came, really, who came to places like Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire were uh, traveling peddlers. They arrived there starting in the 1880s, 1890s, and uh, during the period of time that uh, large numbers of Jews were coming into, from Eastern Europe, coming into places like New York and Boston, uh, these peddlers would go out into the countryside and they would sell their wares to uh, Yankee farmers. And so the story I heard uh, in these two different places, I think one was in New Hampshire and one was in Western Massachusetts, a person I was interviewing who would be, let's say, the grandson or the granddaughter of one of these peddlers who showed up in this town in Maine, let's say in 1900, uh, the, the, the grandchild tells me a story about how when my grandfather first came here, um, he was knocking door to door and uh, he would be invited into the house. Of course, uh, despite whatever prejudices Yankee farmers might have had about Jews or any other non-Yankee uh, non, uh, people around them, they certainly needed the items that these Jewish people were selling, right? Because they lived too far away from the department stores. 
And so there would be at least that uh, much of an impulse to welcome people into their homes. Well, anyway, the grandfather is welcomed into the farmhouse and uh, he shows off his wares. And in both cases, in both versions of the story, uh, that when the, the uh, homeowners, the, when the homesteading family realizes that he's a Jew, uh, they ask him to take out his prayer book and read out loud from the prayer book, read to them in Hebrew. Uh, they were fascinated, they had this fascination apparently with the language of the ancient Israelites uh, as a, you know, as a, from the standpoint of uh, being Protestants, there, that was of interest to them. They felt that these Jews, however outside of the, the circuit of, of uh, blessedness they might have been, at least these Jews, they, they had sort of a direct line to the ancients. And so that was the, that was the, the basic idea that got me going on this project here. I wanted to investigate the history of uh, the earlier history, the colonial period, when, uh, when Jewish people, particularly traders, mostly of Sephardic uh, ancestry, started arriving not in Maine or Vermont, but in places like uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and to a small extent, places like Boston, seaport cities. Uh, the, the degree to which they were uh, engaged by the surrounding Protestant culture. And uh, so that's what got me going on the project. Uh, at that time, as I conceived of it, I, I proposed a grant, and I was fortunate to have a year-long research fellowship at the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is where all my pictures come from, by the way. Uh, so they, they put me up for a year, gave me a year to sit in their archive and look at materials and devote time to writing a book and not teach, so that's how I got the work done. Um, so when I started studying American literature, uh, in my early 20s or whatever that was, uh, there was already a, a, a pattern, a motif among uh, scholars of American literature of concentrating on the, on the Puritan period and drawing parallels between the Puritans and the Israelites because the Puritans themselves were in the habit of doing this. So scholars like Perry Miller, we're talking about in the 1930s and 1940s, were already investigating a, a sort of a, 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 a fairly loose but uh, consistent affiliation and affinity that Puritans had for what I'll call the Jewish legacy, Jewish history, Jewish uh, ideas. So I already knew that that was out there and those scholars had done that work um, quite some time ago. Uh, at the same time that that work was being done, let's say in the middle of the 20th century, uh, Jewish American historians, a, sort of a separate field, were doing their best to document every single Jew that set foot in America before the Civil War, right? Look, looking at all of the instances of Jews in the major cities and in the hinterlands and so on. So that was another body of scholarship that I was able to draw upon. What I wanted to find out, uh, and, and I, that's why I'm so fond of George's uh, s summary of my talk, was how do you square these two things? On the one hand, how do you take this fairly abstract ideological affinity that Puritans expressed for the Jewish uh, heritage, the Jewish um, uh, worldview, how do you combine that with the arrival, the actual arrival, the presence of actual practicing Jews in the New World? How, what happens when you put those two things together? Uh, there were, basically, when I got started on this, what I discovered was that there were two prevailing views on the subject. Uh, and I, I divided them up in the uh, introduction to my book. I divided them up into the wishful thinking school and uh, uh, we'll call it the, the, uh, the reality school, the skeptical school. So the wishful thinking school would include uh, somebody as, as, not, as uh, noteworthy as uh, Max Weber, the sociologist, who many, many years ago drew a connection between uh, the Protestant work ethic and some version of a Jewish work ethic. And he uh, wrote that he, it, it was, there was a natural affinity between Protestants and Jews that developed, he claimed, even in North America in the colonial period, owing to the fact that both peoples had this work ethic. Uh, and so, without any documentation, he basically speculates, well, naturally, the Jews loved, the, the Puritans loved the Jews, they welcomed them with, with open arms into America, and I, of course, I knew that's why I call that the wishful thinking school. It wasn't quite like that. Uh, more recently, there have been other uh, people who have made a similar claim, though, um, 
There are, there's recently a, a, an anthology that came out, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the title of it, um, uh, published by a, a very uh, significant uh, rabbi, orthodox rabbi, uh, with fair, I'll just say neoconservative leanings, arguing that the American heritage owes, uh, the American uh, historical and political heritage owes much of itself to Jewish precedent. I, I still call that wishful thinking. Now the skeptical school, uh, and the skeptical school uh, is primarily, was primarily uh, espoused by these people, specialists in Jewish American history, look at the stories of these Jews on the ground and see, well actually, you know, they weren't really welcomed with open arms for the most part. Uh, yes, there were Jewish communities in New York, there was a, a Jewish community, many Jewish communities in the Caribbean, Charleston, South Carolina, and so on. Uh, one thing that these people notice, Arthur Hertzberg uh, uh, wrote a history of, of the Jews in America in about 1990. He points out that uh, Jews were much, uh, there, were, there were hardly any Jews at all in colonial America, but there were especially few in New England. And that's basically, doc in terms of the documentation, that is true. Nonetheless, the problem with that viewpoint, as I saw it, was that it oversimplifies Puritanism it reduces Puritans to uh, sort of a single entity, and it fails to take in the fact that Puritanism was actually comprised of very diverse points of view, and very, um, uh, very often dialectical, uh, dialectically divided points of view. People uh, who could be considered Puritans run the gamut from John Cotton to uh, Roger Williams. Roger Williams, who was evicted by the Puritans. Well, why was he evicted? He was evicted from Massachusetts because he was too much of a Puritan. He was too much of a separatist. So uh, to reduce Puritanism to uh, sort of a monolithic entity uh, brings about a, 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 a judgment that, well, Puritans closed their doors to everybody. My contention is that Puritans were a modern people, that they were, uh, that their orthodoxy was very much uh, a function of their participation in a, in a transatlantic market economy, and to the extent that Jews were intrinsic to that transatlantic market economy, there was no way that Puritans or anybody else in the colonial uh, American, British or North America could pretend that Jews weren't there. Uh, moreover, because the Puritans were so conflicted, as I mentioned before, there was so much conflict within Puritanism, so many, uh, you know, a uh, whole succession of crises through, particularly if you're looking at the, the second half of the 17th century, just in Massachusetts Bay, every one of those crises, from the antinomian crisis when um, Anne Hutchinson was, was uh, put on trial to Roger Williams, all the way to the Salem witch trials in 1692, whenever a crisis occurred, Puritans would look to historic precedent for guidance, and much of the historic precedent for them could be found in that Hebraic model. And every now and then, they remembered that there were Jews physically present who actually could be consulted. Some of this goes back, in fact, to before the Puritans were here, because in England and in the Netherlands, in the first half of the 17th century, there were interactions. Uh, there were large Jewish communities in Amsterdam, and in London, and these communities were occasionally consulted uh, on theological matters by uh, Protestants. Uh, a sort of fascinating case in point is there was a lot of interest on the part of English Protestants in particular in something that's been called the Jewish Indian theory. Perhaps you've heard this. Some people still are, are proponents of it. I, I think maybe Mormons are. Uh, that that the lost uh, that the Native American people are actually the lost ten tribes of Israel. This was a very intriguing idea to uh, people in England in the to some people in England in the 17th century, and uh, in a few instances, consultations were made so that an English Protestant consults a Jewish rabbi in Amsterdam. The Jewish rabbi has been in contact with Jews in Brazil who claim uh, a claim was made that uh, a uh, a traveling Sephardic Jew uh, somewhere in the Amazon encountered a group of bearded Indians who recited the Shema out loud <laughs> from on the other side of a river. And so when the English uh, theologians heard this story, for them what that meant was, well, we're at the edge of the second coming, you know, the Jews are going to be converted, spread around the world, and so on. 
Uh, who did they ask? They asked Rabbi Benassah ben Israel in Amsterdam, is this true? And he said, well, yes, I, I, I heard the same thing. So these consultations preceded uh, any interactions in North America. I think I'm probably at the point now where I should go to my slides. Uh, and I think this will help me to, uh, to, to bring it down to some of the individual stories here. The first slide here is just uh, some documentary uh, evidence for us of the degree to which Puritans uh, modeled their commonwealth uh, literally on the Israelite commonwealth of the ancient world. And what you see here is a version of, a proposed version of, of law for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was proposed by John Cotton. I think this document dates to 1641. It's in the Massachusetts Historical Society. And the heading up here, it says, uh, Chapter 7 of Crimes. Each, not each, but most of these crimes listed on the left-hand side. There's a corresponding uh, note on the margin that uh, directs you to a passage in Deuteronomy uh, that stipulates a punishment for that crime, including stoning for uh, violating the Sabbath and things like that. And John Cotton, in fact, didn't uh, prevail in this situation. They, they didn't adopt this exact body of laws because, as I said, the Puritans were a modern people. Um, nonetheless, uh, the idea was, was uh, floated around. Our next figure uh, to be thinking about is, uh, some of you probably recognize Cotton Mather. Uh, Cotton Mather, uh, I would make the claim that, and certainly in 17th century New England, he was the greatest scholar of Hebrew on hand. Uh, there were Jews, as I said, there were Jews in places like New York uh, in the 1600s. Uh, he knew Hebrew better than they did. Right? The Jews who came here were merchants for the most part. They were not, uh, you know, they were not rabbis or anything like that. And Cotton Mather, in fact, uh, wrote his master's thesis at Harvard on vowel points in Hebrew. So he was, uh, he was an acknowledged scholar of the Hebrew language. And um, what, where it gets interesting, where you have an, an actual story, is uh, something that occurs involving him and this person here, which is uh, Samuel Sewell, right, a magistrate in the uh, Massachusetts court who uh, gained fame late in his career for being one of the judges in the Salem Witch Trials. He was the only judge who apologized afterwards for the role that he played, and for that reason, apparently, he's the only, his portrait hangs, it might be this very one, actually, a portrait of him, in any case, hangs in the State House, uh, commemorating his acknowledgement of, of the mistake that he made in that case. So, well, in any case, you have both Sewell and Mather are in Boston. Uh, the period of time I'm talking about right now is the very late 1690s. And in uh, roughly 1695, two Jewish brothers arrive in the city of Boston. Their last name is Frazen. They were Sephardim uh, of Portuguese, you know, Spanish, then Portuguese ancestry. Uh, their father had sent them there. Uh, they had come to Boston from Barbados. The father is based in London, and they're conducting, as many other people are, they're participating in what we call the triangle trade. And they're, they're set, sent to Boston for roughly a period of about 10 years. That's what the documents tell us. So uh, as it turns out, well, first I have to tell a circumcision story, because this, this, I, it doesn't fit, my, it doesn't fit my, my argumentative narrative, but you just have to hear this story. A, a, a pirate accomplice of Captain Kidd was brought into Boston Harbor. And um, the uh, authorities wanted to put him on trial. They were pretty certain that it was the guy they said it was. He was an accomplice of Captain Kidd. And what was known about this person who was supposed to be a, an accomplice of Captain Kidd was that early in his piratical career, he had been uh, captured and forcibly circumcised by uh, Arabs somewhere in North Africa. And, but nobody in Boston knew what a circumcised penis looked like, <laughs> except the Frazen brothers. And there is, if you go to the Massachusetts archives, you can find the <coughs> affidavit uh, given by one of these brothers claiming, well, yes, I examined the, the, the subject. He is, in fact, circumcised, uh, apparently, although not according to the Jewish model, I guess the he said that it was a messy circumcision. <laughs> but um, in any case, so these, these two brothers find their way into our archives in that form. 
But uh, for more salient interest is what happens when Cotton Mather decides that he is going to try to convert the Frassen brothers to Christianity. Cotton Mather had wrote, written quite extensively in his diaries about his desire to convert even just one Jew. If he could convert one Jew to Protestantism, his whole life would be worthwhile. And so he contrives to do it, and he hauls this guy, this uh, Frazen uh, businessman, into his study. And according to Sewell, um, he doesn't get away with it. The guy doesn't buy uh, the argument that Mather is making, because what Sewell says in his diary is that Mather actually fabricated a non-existent proof text. That is, he invented a passage that he claimed to be in the Hebrew Bible predicting the arrival of Christ. And what he didn't know was that these two Frazen brothers had gone to the yeshiva in London and they knew the Hebrew Bible better than he thought they would know. Uh, and the reason we know about it is because Sewell wrote about it. Sewell wasn't a very fond fan of Cotton Mather. Why it's salient uh, to the, the argument that I make in the book is that Remember what I was saying before about how Puritans themselves were, had, had, had conflicting ideas about how to live a, a correct Christian life. The problem, uh, as Mather defined it, was that there's a role that we have, to, we have to be activists in bringing about the changes that we want to see that will bring about the second coming of Christ. Um, and Sewell was more of a person who believed, I mean, as, as I'm sure, uh, as fairly clear to people, Puritanism is very much a, a, a defined by people's acceptance of an idea of grace and predestination. And so from Sewell's point of view, it's not, you don't intercede in behalf of God. If the Jews are going to be converted, you don't have to go out there and knock on their doors and try to make them convert. It's going to happen naturally through the, the grace of God. So the disagreement between Sewell and Mather dramatizes that division that, uh, to which I'm speaking uh, in connection with Puritanism. Um, how much time do I have left here? <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, I think I can get through a couple of these things. So I forgot to mention uh, in connection with, um, uh, particularly with Sewell, uh, when Sewell was uh, in his 30s or 40s, I, he went on a brief trip to England uh, for two years, I think. And uh, when he went in England, when he went to England, he visited, among other places, he visited this place. This is the Bevis Marsh Synagogue. It's the oldest synagogue in England. It was built in 1704. The oldest, uh, the, the congregation itself was founded probably about 25, 30 years earlier than that. And Sewell visited the synagogue. He watched uh, Shabbat service there. He writes about it in his diary. And he also, and, and this is uh, the other connected picture here. He also visits the cemetery where uh, the Jews bury their dead. This is a Sephardic congregation. It's still functioning. If you go to London, it's, I, I recommend it as a wonderful tour there. By the way, that's a fox. I just have to point out. That's a fox in the cemetery. He goes to the cemetery, and when he's in the cemetery, he meets a, uh, a Jewish custodian, a groundskeeper. And he writes in his diary about having met this groundskeeper and had, having had a wonderful conversation with the groundskeeper. And when they part ways, uh, Sewell and the groundskeeper, Sewell says, and we wished each other, we wished that we would once again see one another in heaven, uh, and that when we are in heaven together, we will drink a beer. Uh, he says this, I mean, not, he doesn't say we'll drink a beer together, we will, we will have beer together, something to that effect. Uh, to me, this is just a startling thing that Sewell's idea of heaven accommodates the presence of a practicing Jew, not to mention the beer drinking, as a, as a you know as an act of communion together. So Sewell again evinces suggests a, a certain op a certain degree of open mindedness on the subject of Jews. Uh, okay, another story, another phase, another personality. Uh, perhaps uh, people may. Here may have heard of somebody named Judah Monis. Judah Monis was the first uh, teacher, I don't say professor because he never achieved that rank, but he was the first teacher of Hebrew at Harvard. He was born, he was a Sephardic Jew born in the north of Italy 
And uh, for some reason, we still haven't figured out why, he moves to New York in 1716 or so, um, is, uh, from what we can gather, affiliated with the Jewish congregation in New York for a few years, uh, runs a, a, a little hardware store in New York, also sells uh, J Jewish ritual supplies to the Jewish community there. But four years later, he uh, moves from New York to Cambridge, Massachusetts, because he had, uh, on, on what his real avocation was, was that he was a, a, a scholar of Hebrew, and he had written what he called the grammar of the Hebrew tongue. He realized around 1720 that the Jews in New York, as I mentioned before, they are not very good Jews. They don't really know their Judaism very well. They, a, a, an actual ordained rabbi, by the way, doesn't show up in the United States until the 1840s. So there's nothing like a rabbi around. There are lay leaders of the congregation. Nobody is going to enlist this guy as, uh, as uh, in, in that role. But he figures out that at Harvard, they study Hebrew. Remember, I mentioned mm -hmm. Cotton Mather and the vowel points. So he parlays his expertise in Hebrew to uh, the authorities at Harvard College, who include, at that time, Cotton Mather's father, Increase Mather. He sends a copy of the <coughs> Hebrew grammar to them. He proposes that they hire him, that first that they give him a master's degree and that they hire him. And they say, okay, yes, we will do that. Now, of course, well, everybody's favorite phrase these days is quid pro quo. There is a quid <laughs> pro quo here, and I bet you can guess what that would be. Conversion. conversion. So he undergoes a huge public conversion uh, in College Hall in Cambridge. He prepares and publishes a, a tripartite pamphlet. It's about 300 pages long. You can read it online. It's called The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But the Truth. And it's this elaborate uh, testimonial to the correctness of Christianity, uh, his, his, uh, you know, his blood origins as a Jew, and his realization that uh, you know, he was missing the right way. And now he sees that Jesus, in fact, was prophesied in the Bible, and so on. Uh, he makes for it, he's, it, there's an interesting story there. Eventually, he, the, the book is published. The version I showed you up here, the handwritten version, uh, there are a few of these out there, including one at the Mass Historical Society. Uh, and the reason that we even have these handwritten versions is just to put a, an interesting uh, light on how people studied languages in those days. If you were a student in Monus's Hebrew class at Harvard, the way you bought your textbook was you didn't buy your textbook, you hand wrote it. Everybody hand wrote their own version. And so that's why there are about a half a dozen of these. Some of them have doodles in them, interesting doodles. Uh, I don't remember if this one does. Uh, the, the published version, which came out in 1735, the reason they didn't have it until 1735 was that there was no uh, printing press with Hebrew letters until 1735 when one was sent over by ship. And so that was how they were able to prepare this one. Uh, Monis uh, didn't have a very uh, wonderful career. As I say, he was never appointed professor uh, at Harvard. Uh, his students apparently didn't uh, care for him very much. Um, but it's an interesting story. A lot of people have speculated over the years. There were a lot of claims made that, well, his conversion wasn't genuine. You know, he didn't really mean it. Some people said, well, you know what, he actually celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. But if you think about that, that, uh, that isn't necessarily a very big deal because we have Seventh-day Adventists that have been doing that for a long, long time. So uh, Christian, uh, there, there were other Christian people who, who celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. The debate as to whether he actually meant it or not uh, to me is sort of irrelevant. And what was interesting to me in studying his story was trying to understand what role did he serve within the minds of New Englanders, Christian New Englanders? What purpose did he serve? My sense is that the purpose he served was that they were seeing the waning of their orthodoxy. Uh, this was a time when all kinds of uh, market impulses were changing the dynamics in Massachusetts. Uh, people were less, uh, tending to be less and less affiliated with their churches. And so Monus was brought in, I claim, he was brought in to sort of revive the ancient, uh, the, the Hebraic spirit that had militated uh, people like uh, John Cotton and so on in the earlier generations. But uh, there's still new things being found out about Monus. Uh, there are at least, I know of two uh, people who are, who are doing research on him. I'll finish with this picture here. Uh, and, and the one that follows it. 
Uh, we fast forward now very quickly to Newport, Rhode Island, 1770s. Uh, this is Ezra Stiles. He eventually was the president of Yale uh, during the time of the American Revolution. Ezra Stiles was fascinated by Jews, uh, but he wasn't just fascinated by them in the abstract. And for that matter, he wasn't, there's no evidence that he really sought to convert them. What he liked about, well, whatever, what, what, what caused him to be interested in them in the first place was the knowledge that they had and the way and his sense that their knowledge could inform his own Protestantism. Uh, when he was uh, when he was the minister uh, in the uh, Second Congregational Church in New Newport, because he had gone to Yale and hadn't been required to study, Harvard required Hebrew, but Yale didn't, uh, he decided he was going to learn Hebrew in middle age, and he found a Hebrew teacher in the lay leader of the Jewish congregation in Newport, Isaac Turo. So he, te he learns Hebrew in, uh, in his 30s and 40s, and then um, over the next uh, couple decades, he writes extensively in his diary about the Jews in Newport, the congregation, the more illustrious members of that congregation, and in particular, the rabbis who visited that <coughs> congregation. As I said, they didn't have their own rabbi, but they would have itinerant rabbis, particularly this guy. So this is uh, Rabbi Chaim Karagel. He spent five months in Newport. Uh, I think he arrives in March 1773, and he leaves in July 1773, something like that. Um, he's one of six rabbis that Stiles writes about in his diary. Uh, he serves the Jewish congregation there. And Stiles, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating, but it's almost like Stiles falls in love with this man. He writes extensively about the interactions that he has with him. He is in absolute reverence and awe of Caragall's knowledge, his, his theological versatility, his awareness, uh, his, his linguistic abilities with Hebrew and other Middle Eastern languages. Uh, Caragall uh, was a very cosmopolitan person. He had, uh, was actually born in Sfat in Israel, uh, part of a, a, a Sephardic um, colony that had started there in the, 17th, uh, the, the 16th century. Um, very widely traveled, uh, speaks French, Spanish, uh, English, German, Hebrew, and so on. He and Stiles, in fact, correspond in Hebrew, uh, which is an interesting thing. Uh, when, Stiles, uh, when Stiles became the president of Yale, by that time, uh, Caragall had died. Caragall guy died young. He, uh, after he left Newport, he goes to Barbados, where he's the rabbi for the Jewish congregation in Barbados. He dies of smallpox. Uh, uh, but immediately after his death, Stiles goes about uh, uh, getting money together to commission this portrait to be painted of Chaim Caragall. Uh, and Stiles' idea is that he wants this portrait to hang in the library at Yale, where the Yale undergraduates can be uh, sort of uh, influenced uh, by its uh, by the, the, the beauty of this this very uh, sophisticated. Uh, candid uh, scholar that he so admires. I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm, there are all kinds of holes in, in uh, my talk here, and all kinds of things I haven't gotten to, but I know I must be over time, and I'm hoping maybe people have questions or comments. So. Yes? Well, go ahead. Do you know who painted that? Samuel King uh, painted both. Right, I mean, I forgot to say, that, that's what I mean by holes. I forgot to say, the same painter made both. Uh, he was a sort of a journeyman painter in Newport. Uh, you paid him enough money, he would make your portrait. It's interesting, this Stiles portrait, um, Stiles wrote about everything, uh, and among other things, Stiles tells you in his diary what, and you can actually read the titles of it, but he explains why the books are in that order, uh, you know, why this book is here and this book is there, uh, you see this kind of strange uh, thing that looks like a balloon. That's a tetragrammaton in it. And he calls it his personal hieroglyphic for the Shekhinah. That's, what, that's the term that Stiles uses. So Stiles was, was really immersed in uh, Hebraic uh, studies himself. Uh, what was interesting to me about uh, just contrasting the portraits was how much... Uh, how much of an apparatus there is for styles. Right? He, he, every little thing is there for you to see, and uh, you know there's so much iconography in there. 
uh, and the image that he had of Caragal, right, because this is based on what he told the painter to do, Caragal is, is mm -hmm. stuck. You know, you just see him, you see his uh, outfit, and, uh, and that's all you see. Yes? Can you say anything more about the community in Newport? Sure, yeah, so the history of that community is, is kind of interesting. Um, claims have been made that uh, the, the Jews first arrived in Newport in 1658. I don't believe that. Uh, the, the documentation of that is so flimsy. It's basically a tattered fragment of paper uh, from a, a meeting of Masons, uh, and that's all they have to go on. But uh, there was a cemetery purchased in 1677, so that's pretty solid. And the, the evidence suggests that a small group of Jews came to Newport around 1677 from Curacao in the Caribbean. Yeah. Right? The, most of these Sephardim were, uh, they were very engaged in, in trade with the Caribbean. And there were mu the Jewish communities in the Caribbean were much larger than they were on the, on the mainland. And so uh, in any case, a, a group of Jews shows up from Curacao but they sort of disappear from view pretty quickly, and it really isn't until the 1650s that you see an actual uh, community forming, or at least that we find documentation for it. So for instance, in the aftermath, of the, there's a, a, a cataclysmic earthquake in Lisbon, mm -hmm. and uh, many of the, uh, these are conversos, these are Jews who are you know, appearing to be Catholic. Uh, the, uh, the, the sort of social crisis uh, created by that earthquake sends a, a wave of them out of Portugal, and so some of them show up in places like Newport. Uh, the community really gets going then, and uh, the, what we call the Turo Synagogue, where Stiles learned Hebrew, was built in 1763. Uh, and, and then the, the Jewish community there kind of vanished owing to the British invasion in the, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, the, the British actually used the, uh, the synagogue as a hospital. Um, so, so the synagogue had, has a very brief and illustrious history uh, before the revolution, and then as soon as the revolution occurs, that community is dispersed, most of the Jews from Newport. Uh, some of them were Tories, some were uh, not Tories. Most of them went to, back to the Caribbean, or they went to New York, or they went to Philadelphia. Andy. Yeah, uh, Hi. thank you, Michael. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you, well, I'd like your reflection on how Manifest Destiny, as it was expressed by the Puritans, had a Hebrew origin. Hmm, that's, I guess I've no, I have not thought about a Hebrew origin. So when you say Manifest Destiny, I mean, you mean like the geographic destiny of uh, uh, the, the American uh, Republic to, to uh, you know, be on both coasts? That right. Uh, the fact that we're occupying this land is a, is evidence of God's faithfulness. Huh. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, the the the, the, the Jewish participants in this story are pretty un. They're not very ideological. Uh -huh. They're here because they're selling stuff. You know. Uh, they're here because they're participating in this transatlantic trade, and they retain their Judaism. Uh, the way many, the way Jews have done around the world for, for years, just because it's who they are, it's they, they don't want to sever their traditions. But I don't see that that theology, I mean, maybe it plays into Manifest Destiny, maybe to the extent that they uh, collude <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Protestants, they are, uh, you know, they're complicit in it. I wouldn't deny that. But I'm not sure that there's anything within their theology that, that translates to that sort of uh, geographical expansion. For one thing, uh, you know, the occupation of land outside of the land of Israel is not really a, something that Jews are, are in, have been pursuing, right? I mean, there's some, there's some interesting, uh, uh, an odd story that maybe people have heard which moves us a few generations up into the 1830s, maybe people have heard of somebody named Mordecai Emanuel Noah. So this was a guy, he was a, uh, a, a political figure, a playwright, sort of a man, he was a, a briefly an ambassador in Tunisia. He was a Sephardic and a German Jew, lived in New York. And uh, in the 1830s, I think 1835, he's a very 
strong Jacksonian Democrat, which is why the Manifest Destiny comes to mind, he got this idea that he was going to bring all the Jews from around the world and settle them, guess where? You know Grand Island in the Niagara River, like you know, oh, just yeah. between Buffalo and Niagara Falls? He convinced a bunch of people to buy the island, and he issued a proclamation uh, uh, inviting Jews from all over the world to come to Grand Island and found a Jewish republic within the United States. Um, they laid a cornerstone, they had a parade, and that was the end of it. <laughs> it was called Ararat. Uh, and actually, recently, a colleague of mine who does, like, she, she, she's interested in, in sort of virtual reality and, and uh, all this kinds of, apparently there's a, a virtual reality um, version of, like, basically a bunch of people have created, uh, you know, what would it be like if the Jews had actually come there? And so that if you bring your iPhone, I guess you can walk around and see, you know, these, uh, this Jewish paradise. But... Um, that's a, I mean, that, that's a good example of what you're asking about, but it's the only one I know of. I actually meant it in the reverse, and I, I, I'm conscious of the time, uh -huh. that the Puritans were appropriating Hebrew ideas and texts. Oh, oh, I see. And it became something that was actually foreign to the original idea. Oh, I see, I see, right, yeah, yeah, because as new Israelites, they were going to found this, oh, I see where you're going. Yeah. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I'm sorry that I, I miss, no, misunderstood your question. It's a great story. But yeah. <laughs> 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 well, no, you've got to look this guy up. He's, he's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yes? You, you mentioned the Sephardic Jews. Were there many Ashkenazis or any? There were, Europe? yeah. There, there, uh, it's, I think the, 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 domination, the dominance of Sephardic <laughs> has been exaggerated. The early period, until recently, people people who do Jewish American history were saying, well, there's the Sephardic period, and then there's the German period, and then there's the Eastern period. But the, the so-called Sephardic period, there were Ashkenazim during that period. And so uh, uh, this guy, Mordecai Manuel Noah, he promoted himself as Sephardic because there is an association that Jews made or make certainly made at that time that the Sephardim were sort of a, a, a noble class. Um, uh, it was very much, the, the, those were the associations that Jews made, uh, but in fact, he was half Sephardim uh, and half Ashkenazi. Uh, and some of the more illustrious Jews in, in colonial America were Ashkenazi. Haim Solomon, the uh, Revolutionary War financier, was uh, Polish. So. Uh, they're, 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 I would say at the very, if you're talking about the 17th century uh, and Jews in particular, places like Brazil and the Caribbean, most of them are Sephardim. But the ones who show up on the mainland by the end of the 17th century and into the first part of the 18th century, increasing, you know, it's, it's a mixture of, of both. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm looking at the missionaries and uh, coming out of New England and the earliest ones leave in the 18 teens um, to go to, as part of the, the Second Great Awakening to start the millennium where they've converted the Jews, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the plan. You go to the Holy Land, you convert them, and then you'll have peace for a thousand years. And um, Pliny Fisk, for instance, one, who actually was from Shelburne Falls, is an example of someone who goes over and then learns Hebrew and Arabic so that he can read the other holy texts so that he understands them better in mm -hmm. order to convert. Um, but what I've never understood, and I'm wondering if it has something to do with the interactions of the Protestants with the Jews here, is that they take thousands of Bibles in English to the Holy Land and distribute them, <laughs> thinking that this is going to be their conversion tool. And I, I mean, I haven't done maybe enough reading on this part because I've been looking at a little uh -huh. later in different people, but what in the world would have possessed them? To <laughs> well, play? it's this. It might be a similar mentality to. Uh, well, I have a couple things. I mean, none of it makes any sense. Mm -hmm. One is so this idea of the second coming being, uh, you know, accelerated by uh, Jews being in places like uh, the Holy Land and so on and dispersed throughout the continents. Mm -hmm. um, so th some people bought into the idea that the Jews all had to go to Israel, to the Holy Land, before this could happen. But n no, and people were very uh, detailed in their uh, attempts to bring this about. 
nobody thought about, okay, what would it actually look like to put them on ships <laughs> mm -hmm. and take them across the ocean wherever they have to go? So that part uh, doesn't make any sense. And then in terms of conversion pamphlets, I actually, uh, if I had, I, I had almost planned to read to you from uh, Cotton Mather, remember I mentioned, uh, he, he was uh, keen to convert Jews. He wrote, I think in his career, he published three conversion pamphlets. And if you read, you can read any one of those pamphlets, um, the, the first page of the pamphlet is so hostile towards the audience. The first sentence he says, you Jews know that you are wrong. And he couldn't possibly have thought in the same way that these people couldn't possibly have thought that the Jews in, in the land of Israel were going to read English. I don't think he really thought they were going to. So in his case, really, these conversion pamphlets served a different purpose. They were a means by which he spoke to other Christians. And I wonder if it's the same thing. You know, let's make a bunch of Bibles in English and Take, you know, and everybody will know that we have box loads of Bibles we're bringing to the Holy Land and they'll see what wonderful what missionaries we are. Mm -hmm. It might have been more plain to that audience. That's the only thing I can, the only way I can make sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just wondering whether the idea that the Indian tribes were actually Jewish tribes that had somehow gotten there earlier at the same time that we were busily slaughtering them all. Um, I wonder how that, do you have any sense of? Well, OK, that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting question. All right, so first of all, the, the, there were people. Um, John Elliott was a person who translated the Bible into mm -hmm. native languages. I think he bought into this theory. Roger Williams bought into mm -hmm. this theory. Roger Williams published a book. It's called A Key to the, I forget which language, A Key to the Such and Such Language in which he finds all these Hebrew cognates and uh, native. So there were people who genuinely thought this. So the slaughterers and the proselytizers were different. They were different the people. Names. They were different people because, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Elliot and, and Williams, um, you know, we may look back on them now and think about what, you know, crazy, uh, you know, imperialists they were, but their idea was to convert mm -hmm. native people. And it also, this is another aspect of it, was that if people were, if people in, in England were in doubt as to the, how much sense it made to be colonizing North America and wasting resources on colonizing North America, if those people were uh, motivated by Christian interests, you could convince them by saying, well, we are actually there not just to catch fish and cut down trees, but we are going to convert Indians. Uh, who happen to be Jews, and that's going to make them easier to convert because they already are monotheists. That was part of the language, right? They'll, it'll be easy to teach them this stuff because they already have these concepts. We'll convert them, and that will also advance this idea of Jews being distributed throughout the world because if the Indians are Jews, then, well, there's Jews in America, right? right. Um, and it goes as, I mean, it, you can take this as far as uh, is actually a current political debate right now about the Massachusetts exactly. state flag, the state oh, seal, mm -hmm. the original version of which has a native guy saying, come over and help us, <laughs> right? And so that, that, that ideology, the, the, yes, exactly, as you said, the proselytizers and the killers are not necessarily the same. I mean, it might be the proselytizers become the killers mm -hmm. in 10 years, mm -hmm. but for a period of time, they are separate interests. I think we should yeah. call a call it a day. But I, okay. are you willing to hang around for? I'm, I'm willing to hang around. I have there, there are books. I put a couple on the table. I also have my my more recent book, which is of similar interest. Uh, and so, if anyone is interested in the book, let me know. And I'll yeah, I'm not rushing off anywhere, so I'm happy to talk more. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.